Hi, welcome to Awaken. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Trevor. I'm the director of student ministries here at Awaken. And happy Memorial Day. We're not in person this time, so no complaints here. But if you're new, uh, we'd love to know that you were here. Special welcome to you. The best way to get plugged in with our congregation is to go to the Awaken website and fill out a connections card. Uh, someone will reach out to you and hopefully we can get to know you a little bit more uh, through that and get you plugged into some of the things that are happening here at the church. I am here to lead us in the call to worship. I'm going to be taking us through Romans 8, which, uh, as I've been reflecting on, feels like it has some layers to it. Um, the idea that God is using our hardships and sufferings uh, to do good things in us and in the world and looking at where we're at in the world right now in the middle of a pandemic it feels like there are some really good things on the horizon we're meeting in person for church again taking masks off getting vaccinated and if you're anything like me you might be a little anxious about that um i was at mall of america yesterday i'm going to tell a story i was at mall of america yesterday and it was probably the most overwhelmed i've been in over a year just being around that many people and so if that's you, if you're holding anxiety right now, if you're a little bit overwhelmed uh, seeing people again and doing all the things, um, we're with you in that. You are not alone. Uh, I, I'm holding that as well. And so you have space here. Um, it does belong, and God may be using it. Um, and then if you're joyous and giddy and celebratory, like we're with you in that too, uh, the goodness seems to be here. Um, but it really begs the question for me, like, can we be a congregation that can hold hardship and struggle and celebration and goodness at the same time with one another and know that we're all in it together and it all does belong? Um, I hope so. And so I'm going to read Romans 8 over us. Um, and if you will... Receive it. Verse 18 through 21. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Amen. The sun will rise, the sun will rise, bringing life to the earth as it springs from the ground. The sun will rise, the sun will rise, won't you dry all your tears, they are burdened down, won't you dry all your tears, they are burdened down.
Before we move on, we are going to sing the sweet song of blessing over our dear children. Um, Dan is going to lead us. May God give you eyes to see all that is good, all that is good. The courage for anything. May you be Everybody. Welcome to Awaken. Um, my name's Mike, if we haven't met. Glad that you're here. Um, I've got my summer outfit on, my black v-neck, because it's hot outside. It's hot in here. Um, by the way, for those that didn't, uh, or for those that were planning on attending church last week in the park, man, sorry about that, you know. I have a lot of compassion for the weather people, trying to predict the weather and plans related to the weather. So, you know, it's 50-50. It was either going to rain or it wasn't going to rain, and we decided to cancel church, and then, of course, it didn't rain. If we had church, it probably would have rained buckets, but that's the way the cookie crumbles, as they say. 
So um, that's kind of how we'll roll throughout the summer. If it's like threatening rain, we'll make a decision that Sunday morning and, and then we'll just live with it, people, because that's what you do. Um, we are in week five of a series, Wells and Fences. So if you're just joining us, um, we'll catch you up to speed here in a little bit. Next week, we're going to finish up that series. And then in the following week, we'll start a new series that we do in the summer called Lost in Translation, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but this morning, I want to begin with a story about William Wilberforce. You might recognize that name, uh, famously a part of what was called the Clapham sect. Um, this was a really bizarre group of people. Uh, history tells us that it was a real diverse group of people, a brewer, a mathematician, a rector, a philanthropist, a banker, an economist, a playwright, an author, a whole bunch of different people. The chairman of directors of the East British India, wait, the East, the British East India Trading Company, that's a mouthful, um, but many others, they comprised what was called the Clapham sect. And as the story goes, Wilberforce and his pals like rode around London and um, essentially invited people uh, a diverse and varied group of people with different beliefs and lifestyles and convictions to gather around one idea, and that one idea was the abolition of slavery. His question was not, do you believe what we believe? And there was a list of things that people had to check off about theology and politics and any number of other things. But rather, do you care what we care about? And that is the abolition of slavery. He created, before it was ever called it, a centered set community. Uh, a diverse group of people whose common bond was the one thing in the center. The gravitational pull of the abolition of slavery is what drew the people in. Uh, Wilberforce saw a problem that needed to be solved, and he employed what Paul the uh, Tebert later calls a centered set philosophy to address and solve the problem. The opposite of that is a bounded set, and a bounded set leader or, or philosophy asks, do you believe what we believe? And, and there's a list of things usually, and it, it quickly separates those who are in and those who are out. Uh, it, it limits those who can work to solve the problem, which is unfortunate, um, to, to, to whether or not you agree on our beliefs or not, you know, unless you believe you can't help kind of a thing. Um, but Wilberforce and his pals gathered around one single idea, which allowed for a very diverse and powerful force of love, love and liberation in the world. And that's the kind of church we want to be. That's what Wells and Fences is all about. Um, we want to say that we want to gather around a well. There's one thing in the center. that the, Our common bond is not our agreement on all sorts of theological matters, but the one thing, and that is the life and teachings of Jesus. We believe that Jesus and his life and teachings are worthy of gathering around because he died and resurrected and is the Christ. But it's the one thing in the center that we want to gather around and that we want to sort of say um, that's our common bond, not our uh, agreement on doctrine or dogma or any number of things, but rather, do you care about what we care about? And Jesus cared about, well, lots of things. He cared about love. He cared about grace. He cared about forgiveness and, and, and um, kindness and compassion, forgiving even your enemy. He cared about justice for the oppressed and the marginalized, giving voice to those who don't have voices. So if you care about those things, saddle up, partner. You're welcome to join us. Um, but that's what this series is about. So the life and teachings, the death and resurrection of Jesus is the well. And then I've suggested in the weeks following that in order for us to be this kind of community, there might be some things we, we would want to pay attention to. Number one, the value of curiosity and questions, um, that we would become a curious and, and uh, kind of people, but then also who value a deep question and, and a good question. Uh, that we would, we would recognize that our practice of our belief, our, our orthopraxy, is as important as our orthodoxy or the rightness of our belief. And then last week we talked about, if we're going to do this, we need to be dependent upon something other than ourselves, because that goes foul real quickly, and that thing is the Holy Spirit that has been given to the church according to the book of Acts and according to Jesus' prayer in John 14 and John 17. So today, I want to talk about Revelation. And friends, I'm not talking about the weird book at the end of the Bible that everybody gets a little nervous about. I'm talking about the idea or the, when someone or something reveals itself or themselves to you. Uh, in the prior years, when we've done Wells and Fences, we've talked about the centrality of the Word of God, which is one of the six affirmations of the covenant. But as you know, if you've been following along, we're sort of steering clear of that, those six affirmations, not because they're bad or we don't believe in them anymore, but rather, Wells and Fences doesn't depend on the six affirmations of the covenant. So, 
Today I want to use a long throw lens. I want to zoom out a little bit and I want to try to get a bigger picture of what I would argue is actually more important and that is the idea of revelation. So here's how we'll spend our time together. I want to offer an assumption, a reality, and then a question. We're going to move through the first two, the assumption and the reality, a little quicker than the latter, and then we'll spend the most of our time on the question. So are you ready? Let's do this. Um, an assumption. Here's my assumption. Actually, you know what? I'm going to start with a word of prayer and then we'll jump in. How's that sound? Let's pray. God, I thank you for our time together. I thank you for this community for the people that call it home, for those who have been with us and who have left, for those who have not yet joined us but who will in the future. We're grateful for all the ways that your spirit has been constant and at work and with us. And I pray that that would continue to be the case, that you would continue, that you would walk with, that you would challenge, invite, move towards us, um, invite us to be the kinds of people that you've called us to be, I pray. In the strong name of Christ and by the power of the spirit, the church said together, amen and amen. Okay, friends, an assumption. The assumption that I begin this sermon with and that I actually base the entire sermon on is the idea that God is interested in revealing themself. Themselves? Themself. Uh, and you may have noticed uh, I, I chose to use the word themselves or themselves, and I'm going to continue to do that because, well, God is Trinity, three in one. We talked about that last week, and it would make sense that God is a they, them. So we're going to talk about they and them as if they do exist in three persons but one essence. So my assumption is that God's interested in revealing themselves to us. A long time ago, my friend Katie Sanders spoke at Awaken when we used to meet at the joke joint. And she said something that I'll never forget and that I think is actually really essential, important, in terms of understanding the God of the Bible. And that is this. As it relates to God and God, um, well, God's interest in being found or revealing themselves, uh, while it doesn't always seem like it or feel like it, she says, this is not a maze, this is not a trick. And what she meant by that was, in terms of God wanting to be, or God's interest in being found, this is not a maze. It's not a trick. God is not out there trying to trick you or create some sort of maze-like path that you have to figure out how to get to the end of, some sort of labyrinth. But God is interested in revealing God's self. And while it doesn't feel like it at times, I think you can argue a pretty strong case from Scripture that that, that is in fact true. From the very beginning of the story, in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve eat from the, the tree, God comes and finds them when they're hiding and asks the second question in the story of God, which is, where are you? Later in the story, God calls Abram in chapter 12 and promises to make him a great nation. In chapter 22, he says his name, Abram, Abram, or at that point, Abraham, Abraham, and, begins, uh, and then goes on to show Abraham that, he's, that, that they are not like the rest of the gods around them who would require a, a son, a, a firstborn sacrifice, but rather that this god is different than the rest of the gods. Um, Hagar, in Genesis chapter 16, meets God in the desert and is the first woman to name God, and she names God as the one who sees me. Genesis 20, uh, 32, God wrestles with Jacob, and then in chapter 46, God calls Jacob's name. This is just the book of Genesis. The book of Exodus begins with God appearing to Moses at a burning bush. We could go on and on, but I think you get the point. Time and time again through the story of the Bible, God is interested in revealing themselves to us, to anyone who has eyes to see and ears to hear, which is something you hear Jesus say later. So that's the assumption. This is of interest to God, that, that they would be, reveal themselves to us. So that's the assumption. The reality is that the full revelation and the fullness of revelation has happened. And I'm just going to read three short little passages from the New Testament that are just packed with foundational theological ideas. So Philippians chapter 2 says this, in your relationships, this is Paul talking to the church of Philippi, he says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who, Christ, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is the kenosis passage of Philippians chapter 2, that the Christ, the second person of the Trinity, 
becomes in flesh, incarnate, human in the person of Jesus. God is interested in revealing God's self. Colossians chapter 1.15 says that Paul, again, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, Jesus is the image, the firstborn over all creation. He goes on in verse 19 to say, God was pleased to have all of God's fullness dwell in Jesus. If, if you imagine a house where God might live, it's the, it's the skin and bones, the flesh and blood, the body of Christ, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1 The writer says, the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation, the icon of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Friends, this is the beauty, this is the power, this is why Easter matters in the Christian story and what separates or sets Christianity apart from other stories. According to history, like the kind of history that we value even in 2021, and eyewitnesses, Jesus... The man who was and is the Christ lived, died, and was resurrected and promises to come again. So the assumption is God is interested in revealing himself. The reality is that God has revealed God's self in full in Christ, in Jesus. And so that leaves us with a question. The question is, is God still interested in revealing God's self? Is God still in the business of revealing themselves to us right here, right now in 2021? And even though we've done some serious lifting in the first two points, this is where the meat of the sermon, this is the white meat of the coconut, as this one person, actually, ironically, it was the worst boss I ever had and the person who almost made me leave ministry forever. That's who said the white meat of the coconut. Maybe I should find a different phrase. (laughs) Either way, it's true, so I've kept it. Now we're getting to the white meat of the coconut right here. Um, Is God still revealing and offering himself to us today? And if so, how? Four important ways that I want to highlight, four categories of knowing a revelation. The first of which is, duh, the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. This is obvious, right? It's the one most Christians are, are comfortable with because for so long the Bible has been at the center. I don't even have my Bible today. I have it all written in my notes But the Bible has been at the center of our conversation, of our life together. In fact, after all, it is the word of God. Um, One of my favorite quotes about the Bible is from a paper written in 1963 called Biblical Authority and Freedom, and it says this, The spiritual power of pietism, the pietist movement, lay in its recovery of a vital and dynamic use of the Bible. The early pietist approach to the scriptures was not new, rather... It was the rediscovery of a living view that the scriptures are alive and active, able to to cut through bone and marrow and things that are important. A living view of the Bible which characterized the early Reformation. Our forebears considered the Bible to be a book which, referring to many things, is primarily about one thing, our salvation and the power to walk therein. Its essential content is the gospel, the good news about Jesus. To read it properly, therefore, is to find it an altar where one meets the living God. This is the Bible. And for so many of us, we've, we could tell story after story after story of how God encounters us, finds us, reveals themselves to us through the Bible. I remember studying with Rabbi Allen not too long ago. Uh, we were studying Aaron, uh, Aaron num- Numbers chapter 6, which is the ironic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his face. That's the ironic blessing. So we're studying the ironic blessing. Rabbi Allen's leading us, and I'm, I'm like super excited about it because I, I love this passage. And it was a little lackluster, if I'm going to be honest. I don't know if Allen was off his game or what. But we get to the end of it, and I'm kind of like, hmm, meh. And then he says, we get to the last verse, and it says this. They will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. And I was like, they? Who's They? So I asked, I said, who's they? And we go back to the beginning of the passage and, 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 and the passage says, essentially speaking to Moses and he says, tell Aaron and his brothers. That's who they is, Aaron and his brothers. Now to the non-Bible person, that might not seem significant, but to anybody who's studied the Old Testament and knows who Aaron is and what his job was, he was the head dude in the priestly line So they are the priests, the pastors. 
And then it dawned on me. They will put my name on the people and I will bless them. And that's when I started giving the ironic blessing over you every week. Because every week they, me, get to speak God's name over your life. And that insight, that revelation, that little nugget of joy came from scripture. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I never even saw it coming. The second category I want to offer is the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14 says, All this I have spoken while, I, while still with you, this is Jesus speaking, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I said to you. One of the ways God continues to reveal himself is through the work of the Holy Spirit, who enlightens, who illuminates. We talked about this last week. In 2013, I was in Israel with this group of people that I studied with, and I had this experience in Israel where I sensed and felt the Holy Spirit speaking and leading and offering an invitation deeper into relationship and experience with God. I sensed God speaking and inviting me to leave some things, primarily my anger about my relationship with my dad, and to be open to, to leave some things so that I could receive something else, something new. And often, It's the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit that speaks and reveals. And this happened over weeks, over a a long period of time where I began journaling and writing in my journal about these things. And I, I I remember the night where I wrote in my journal, I think I'm ready to stop being angry about my dad. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. And friends, here's what nobody ever talks about. Here's what nobody ever says. You know, we talk about the Holy Spirit in the church and it's so important. Oh, it's the third person in the Trinity. Let's not forget she, it's often, almost always, referred to as her in the Bible. Let's not forget about her. Well, that's interesting. Um, that's another day. But here's what nobody says about the Holy Spirit. Like, how does it actually happen? What does it sound like? Um, like, could, is there a formula for this? And I'll just say there isn't. But I'll tell you what it feels like for me. So that you have, like, maybe some sense from someone that you maybe trust about what it feels like and is like when the Holy Spirit speaks or moves or, or reveals. For me, it comes to me. It's as if, it, it, it's as if it, it makes its way, this thought, this word, this voice, this um, in, intuition. It, like, moves towards me. And in the same way, it, it, it's born outside of me. Not like it's not my thought, but, but it, its genesis, it, its birthplace is outside of me and it makes its way to me. And then honestly, it often sounds like my own voice. Now, that might seem a, a slippery slope, Micah, but uh, how else would it sound if God were to speak to you? I mean, if you were to just, like, talk to yourself right now, who does it sound like? Yourself. In your mind, when you think about something and you hear a voice, it's your voice. Like, what other voice would there be? It's not like some person named Bob who's, like, downloaded an app so that you hear Bob's voice in your head. No, you hear your own voice. So we've been told not to trust our own voice, which is problematic because when the Spirit speaks to me, it's often in my own voice. You see what I'm saying? So I want to just offer that to you. It, for me, it, it, it comes to me and it starts, begins, its genesis, its birthplace is outside of me. But in the end, ultimately, often, it does sound like my own voice. Um, this last week, somebody texted me actually about last week's sermon and they were like, you know, the Holy Spirit's been used to damage a whole lot of people and people have, you know, used that, well, the Spirit said to exert power and influence over someone in a very inappropriate way or inappropriate ways. And all that is well and true. And I would just offer a couple of things as it relates to the Holy Spirit. I said in response to this person, I said, isolation and the denial of truth. When someone says, oh, the Spirit said to me, and that person lives in isolation, or they they don't allow, they don't have deep relationships that can call something into account, or they live in isolation from reason and scripture and tradition and a whole bunch of other things that sort of help understand, help um, 
what's the word I'm looking for, like uh, qualify or uh, legitimate a, 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 a claim. If that person lives in isolation or, or is isolated from those things, like danger beware, Will Robinson. And then also if they deny that there's truth outside of the Bible, like in science or psychology or any number of other things, those two things combined with one another, very dangerous. Socrates said that, the, uh, that uh, balance in everything, and I tend to agree with him on this one, as we think about the Holy Spirit and how it speaks to us, it's important to sort of surround that word of the Holy Spirit with reason and scripture and tradition and communi- a, a group of people who can call uh, crazy when crazy arrives. So that's not in the notes. That's free. But I think that's important to say. So there's the Bible. There's the Holy Spirit. Two very obvious ways. But let's keep going. I would say number three, creation. The mystics, the mothers and fathers of the church, often spoke about the word of God Christ the word of God in the Bible, and the first word of God in creation. Richard Rohr writes this, 2,000 years ago marks the incarnation of God in Jesus, but before that there was the incarnation through light, water, land, sun, moon, stars, plants, trees, fruit, birds, serpents, cattle, fish, and every wild beast of every kind according to the Genesis story. This is the cosmic Christ through which God has let us know the mystery of God's purpose, hidden Uh, The hidden plan made from the beginning in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1. Christ is not Jesus' last name, but the title for his life's purpose. Christ is our word for what Jesus came to personally reveal and validate, which is true all the time and everywhere. So good. Love it. Creation for me has been a a primary mode of revelation, where I have heard words uh, and, um, well, the voice of God. Uh, I I can think of two experiences in particular. One of them actually was when I went and spent some time with Richard Rohr. A group of us went down to the Center for Action and Contemplation. This this actually, I love telling this story because it's just too good to be true. (laughs) I'm literally sitting with like Father Richard Rohr, you know, Franciscan mystic in this retreat center and this bird, this tiny little bird, you know, St. Francis, care, care, you know, a lover of creation, this bird comes into this retreat center through a sliding glass door, and he tries to go out another sliding glass door, and he hits the window, and he can't get out. And there he is, just, she, she, I don't know, stunned, like can't move. And we're all kind of like, oh my gosh, what just happened? So me being an eight, or I don't know, I just got up, and I went over, and I picked up this little bird, and I held him right in my hand. I could see his beady little eyes, and I just, like, stared at him for a little while. And then he kind of, like, came to his senses, and I walked him over to the other window, which was open, and I put him out in the open air, and then they flew away. <laughs> Richard Rohr was like, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> It happened to be again in my house. This bird flew into my, my window, and River and I went out there, my dog, and we just sat with the little bird. And we, like, tiny, tiniest little feet and eyes and feathers. If you've ever been that close to a bird, it is stunning how beautiful they are. And as I sat there holding this bird, I thought to myself, who made this thing? And there I was in the presence of the divine. My mom tells this story about when she used to go up to the North Shore a lot. She came from a long line of women who made things, knitted, crocheting, sewing, and she never saw herself as an artist, and we were having this conversation, and she shared about how when she goes up to the North Shore, it dawned on her that the colors that she saw while she was up there would always make their way into the things that she made because she felt so connected to God in creation. Friends, do not underestimate creation when it speaks and it is always speaking lastly i would say community if we're talking about revelation and god revealing themselves to us you have the bible you have the holy spirit you have creation but don't forget don't underestimate the value of community the people who know you who love you who are around you who have the the capacity or the chips to play and call out something in you or call you in or call you out i asked this question on facebook um, about like hey i'm i'm speaking about this have you ever heard god speak through these four things and one person wrote this on the fireside page that i just had to share and this was about their experience their family's experience of community and hearing and experiencing 
the revelation of God in and through this community. She wrote, God has felt so far away the last few years. I haven't been able to pray much other than, Lord, I believe, but help, me, help my unbelief. But in the midst of all the really hard things, our community has never given up on us or stopped showing up to love us. And that is where I am able to truly see the love of God. I can say that I have seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. By the way, we have been loved through the valley. That's you. That's this church. I can think of so many stories where the voice of my wife or my kids or a family member or those who were close to me was one of those moments where time stands still. I would, I would, kairos and chronos are two Greek words that talk about time. Chronos is like chronological and kairos is like when time stands still. And when you hear the voice of God through the, the voice of another person, those are kairos moments where time slows down and stands still and you're invited to step into that moment deeper and further into relationship with God and time and time again that has happened in my life. I can think when we were first starting this church, one of our best friends, Liz, said to Laura and I when we were talking about and sort of casting the vision for what Awaken could be or would be someday, maybe, if the Lord should bless, and she looked right at us both and she said, Micah and Laura, people will be drawn to Awaken because of your authenticity. And I think about that moment and how true it was and how true it is and how true it remains in our community, that people are drawn to this place because of the authenticity of the people and those who inhabit it. I remember another friend of mine, Mary, we were talking about, I was having a, well, let's call it a crisis. Let's call it for what it is, right? A bit of a crisis in uh, being a pastor and what it means to be a pastor and Mary is a bit of a prophet. Actually, ironically enough, the kids' blessing that we sing every single week was written by Mary Weens and put to music by John Mark Nelson so long ago. So Mary is a prophet. She speaks words of truth. She speaks the word of the Lord sometimes to me. And she said, Micah, I had this vision of you in the quietness of my heart, and I want to share it with you. And she said, I saw this picture of you like in, in the threshold of a doorway, holding the door open for people as they were passing through that threshold from one side to the other. And you were just standing there holding the door open. So I wonder if you're not a gatekeeper, a door holder opener. That's a word of the Lord. That's a word of the Lord for me in my life and who I've become as a pastor. And that came from community, friends. If we're going to gather around a well instead of build fences... And the well is the life and teachings, the death and resurrection of Jesus. In case you haven't noticed, Jesus isn't here anymore. Like he's left the building for a, a brief period of time. He says he's coming back and I believe him. But he's not here. He's not physically here. Which makes this whole like hearing from God or God revealing himself to us a little tricky. But again, I would go back to where we began. God has always been interested in revelation, revealing himself to us from the very beginning of the story and has done so in and through Jesus and continues to reveal himself to us through scripture, through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, through creation itself, through the voice of our community and the people around us. I only chose four. We could probably say more, but I want to offer those four. Friends, we sang this song last week, but if we want to be a community that's gathered around the well, we're going to have to listen well. So to he or her, him or her, who has ears to hear and eyes to speak, feet to walk, come and be near me, says the Lord. So that's my hope. That's my prayer. That's what I'm trying to do in my own life. I'm hoping to lead by example as we gather around this well, that we would be listening, tuning our ears and our hearts to the revealing God who's doing so through scripture and through creation and through the Holy Spirit and through one another, that we might become more and more and more like the one thing we are gathered around, which is the life of Jesus. May it be true. Let me pray for us. God, as we take just a few moments to be still and be quiet, I pray that through the work of your Holy Spirit that you would um, meet us, be near us, um, 
pull us close so that we can hear your heartbeat, the tone of your voice, the sound of your breath. And as we do, we want to hear from you. We want to see you in new and fresh ways. If there are ways that we see or hear or interact with you that are inaccurate, that aren't based in truth, I pray that you would begin to do that work of removing those pathways in our brain and replacing them with new ones that are true. Images and sounds, senses, feelings that are accurate representations of who you are in our mind's eye. So Holy Spirit, we we come to you in this moment and ask that you would do that work for us. I pray. Well, we're going to close with a song that's probably new to everybody, Uh, but I heard it uh, this last week, and I thought about God revealing God's self, and um, I looked back on when I feel like I've experienced revelation in my life, and I can honestly say the strongest revelations that I have um, is when I've just made myself proximate to people who are suffering. the least of these. Uh, So this song is inspired by Matthew 25 where Jesus does this really amazing thing and he uh, places himself in solidarity with the poor, with the needy, with um, those who are in prison. And he says um, in a projection of the kingdom to come uh, to those that serve those folks, when you did this to the least of these, you did it to me. And um, I've just found that to be true, that I experience God in such a beautiful way and from these people that have lived stories um, that I will never understand. And they have experienced God in a way that I've never experienced God. And it just blows my mind open with the beauty um, of how God exists in the most unlikely places. Um, So this song is in celebration of that. And if you're with me, uh, if you're one of those people too, I hope it kind of brings you back to those memories if you have them of when you've experienced God, when you've uh, placed yourself among um, those who would be considered the least of these.
Sometimes uh, <clears throat> there are moments along the way where things just kind of come together that you didn't see. And, you know, I write sermons every week and I try to bring like the best that I can uh, to you all. And then that happens. And Mel, your perspective, your, uh, it, it makes it more and it, it adds adds value, something that I didn't see. Um, and I'm grateful for that, for the way the Spirit works. Um, so as we make our way to the table, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup and he blessed it. He said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. As we make our way to this table that is so familiar, it's important to remember that it's not ours. It's not mine. It's not the church's. It is the resurrected Christ who claims this table, who claims the right to invite whoever he wants to it. So, come. This table's been made ready for those who love God, and those who want to love God, those who have a lot of faith or a little bit of faith, those who have been here often or maybe it's been a long time or never before, those who have tried to follow and those who have failed miserably in following. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. So if you consider yourself today among one of those, come. Come and eat. Come and hear. Come and be filled. Come and be healed by the body and blood of Christ. It's just bread and wine. But it's not just bread and wine. It's a story. It's a moment in history when everything changed. God, I hope that's true. I believe that's true. So, take the bread and hear these words. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. As you take the cup, I invite you to hear these words. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Whew. I'm going crazy <laughs> living in a room with nobody in it except for my friends. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean that to be a slight to anybody here. <laughs> you get what I mean. Oh. It's been good to be together outside, but I, I cannot wait for that moment when we're here in this room together and we get to hear our voices. Whew, it's going to be good. Uh, a couple things as you go that you should know about. Number one, there's an artist mingle happening this Thursday, June the 3rd. Uh, there's a Zoom link in the Awaken Weekly for that. Mel leads that, so if you want to join that little 
band of brothers and sisters, feel free. Everybody's welcome to that. There is a food drive we've been doing. Um, since we weren't in the park last week, we're going to postpone that. We'll be back in the park again on June the 6th. If you're watching this, you know we're not in the park today, the 30th, Memorial Day weekend. But next week, we'll be in the park. So if you have food, you can bring that. That'll go to the lift over on the east side. Uh, the annual meeting is coming up, friends. Oh my gosh, the annual meeting is here, June the 13th. We're going to have a picnic in the park. Um, I think that's 11 o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the details will be in the Awaken Weekly. If you're a partner, you should be getting a partner's report this weekend, actually today. You'll get the budget, the proposed budget. And then last but not least, Youth Group Overnight, Trevor, June 11th. Registration link is in the Awaken Weekly and on the website. Lots going on. Sign up by June the 6th. It's going to be fun. It's at the Kepharts. A little mystery dinner at the Kephart's tennis court and then just ballyhoo and tomfoolery for all. So you should join. Um, that is all I have for you, friends. Now I get to put God's name on you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the church said together, Amen. Grace and peace, friends. See you next week.